Kings chapter 18, uh, verses 17 to 39, but we'll read from 21 to 24. Let's read these verses together in one voice in honor of God's word. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 21 to 24 is the passage uh, excerpt we're reading from on today's story. So, thank you, Faisal. Uh, let's read from verse 21. Ready? Go. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am I left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bulls be given to us, and let them choose one bull for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull, and lay it on the wood, and put on no fire to it. And you call upon the name of your God, and all call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. Amen. This is the word of God. Um, as you recall from last spring, I hope you recall, uh, we finished off with King Solomon. And we finished off with King Solomon's um, wisdom literature, the Ecclesiastes, and we looked at uh, David's literature of Psalms and all these wonderful, beautiful literature of God. And we continue on the next section of the Old Testament, which is actually a divided kingdom. See, the unified kingdom closed, ended as of Solomon. After Solomon's death, the kingdom was divided, split into two. Faisal, do you happen to have the map on there? Is that ready for us? I emailed you um, just in case, but you can find that's great. If not, it's okay as well. So uh, why did the kingdom get split after Solomon? Well, Solomon's son, his name was uh, Rehoboam. Rehoboam, he rebelled against God. He was not a God worshiper. He was a Baal worshiper. And so God took away David's family, the, the throne of David from the entire nation. Now only the, uh, David's son, uh, grandson, who is um, Solomon's son, uh, Rehoboam, he get to rule over two tribes of so southern Judah, whereas the ten tribes form the country of northern Israel. And so a new chapter in the uh, life, in the life of the nation is starting. And uh, we know that uh, Solomon's servant who became king of northern Israel after Solomon's death. His name was uh, 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 Jeroboam. So very similar. Jeroboam in the north and Rehoboam in the south. It's confusing, right? And so uh, we pick up in the northern kingdom of, uh, of northern Israel. Well, it's not the first king. It's not uh, Jeroboam that we're going to look at this morning, but it is the seventh king of the northern kingdom, and his name was Ahab as we famously know, the, the battle with uh, Ahab and uh, Elijah the prophet. Why do we look at this period in history, the seventh king of uh, the northern Israel kingdom? It's because it was a time when northern Israel was so far away from God. It was a time when they were, they were, trying, they were getting into the period of stability, the economic prosperity, and uh, there was uh, political stability. But... Uh, in relation to stability in the world, there was, so spirit, there was a lot of spiritual uncertainty, and they fell away from God. They were the furthest away from God under the reign of King Ahab. You know, as we look at our lives today, our culture, I think we need to read the times, read the culture, the spiritual things that are happening around us. It's not hard to see that uh, we live in, live in a post-Christian U.S., post-Christian Western world. What does that mean? Just like post-modernism, after modernism, there's post-modernism, and there's relativism and all these isms. After, you know, Christ, Christ uh, gospel has been preached all over the Western hemisphere, you know, in Europe and in the U.S., now there's a lot of young people leaving the church. And there are people, uh, the church has been it's become a, a political force sometimes. And so the church is criticized and the gospel is rejected. And as Bible-believing Christians, you and I, we get discouraged sometimes from expressing our faith in public because we can be ridiculed for 
actually believing the word of God. When the principles, the founding principles of this country was upon this word of God. But the reality is the country, the culture has deviated from God so much that the Christians are looked upon, frowned upon, and seen, against, seen as a, be, a group of people being against society. And, and this word of God gives us a clue. How could we continue to live in faith, faithful servants of God, in an Asian culture, Asian culture when it's uh, post-Christian? And uh, the answer is that God has to show up. And as God shows up in our lives, we are confident that this is the direction that God wants us to live. And we are not swayed by the culture and, and the trends of the, of, the, of the generation, but we can live according to the firm word of God. And so we look at this period of King Ahab, when things kind of w w uh, went south, things were upside down now. It was a Christian, not Christian, it was a God-fearing nation at first, but they deviated so much that Elijah and the prophets were being, uh, they were being persecuted by the Baal worshippers. And as we read this together, as we read this story together, we want to answer this question, how does God answer today? What is God's reply to our, 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 our problems, our suffering? What is God's reply? Thus the sermon title, Reply, O Gods. It is a contest of the gods this morning. And we pick up in the famous story of Elijah and the Baal prophets and Ahab, the king, who is the leader of all the false prophets. We uh, see in verse 17 and 18, that's where our story picks up. Uh, we just read an excerpt from this morning in verse 21, but when, I want you to uh, look at 17 and, and on, if you can. And this was an encounter between, Elijah, uh, between King Ahab, the northern king, the seventh king of northern Israel, and Elijah, the prophet of God that God sent. There is a history before this uh, meeting. You have to understand the history. In chapter 17, verse 1 of chapter 17, the previous chapter, uh, Ahab was told by Elijah, the last thing that Ahab heard, the king heard from the prophet was, there will be drought, many, many years of drought in this land because you have sinned against God, because you do not fear and worship God. And so they heard this, Ahab heard this, and sure enough, for three years, there was no rain. There was drought. And the crops, there were no crops, and the animals and people were dying. And so they had suffered much. After that, God sent, after three years, God sent Elijah to Ahab, this confrontation. And so you can see the bitterness that was built up on in Ahab's heart. The first thing he said, is it you, Elijah, the troublemaker of Israel? You are the troublemaker of Israel. And so um, you can see the bitterness in Ahab's heart of the suffering of, of himself and the people of northern Israel. And uh, Elijah corrects him, spiritually corrects him. King Ahab, it is you who are the troublemaker, not I. You have fallen away from the worship of God, and you haven't worshipped Baal, and this is what has happened because of you. But Elijah knew quickly that he was not there to argue with the king, to sit, set things right, who's wrong and who's right. That was not the purpose of this meeting. He knew that words, discussions would never resolve this, uh, this conflict, spiritual battle. And he suggests an uh, amazing contest of, um, of seeing who the true God is. And as you recall, he says, Elijah said, you bring 450 of your Baal prophets. You have many prophets in this country. And I'm the only God worshiper. I am only the, the one, so, one person that believes in God in this country. You bring the 40, 450 Baal worshipers and also bring the 400 Asherah worshipers, the female goddess worshipers. And let's do this contest. We'll have two bulls, one for each side, one for your side, one for my side. And uh, prepare the wood, prepare the altar. And whoever Whichever God answers in fire, let's not put fire on either of the altars, but whoever answers in fire will know that this is the true God and we will worship him. And this is the, the challenge that uh, Elijah puts for, before them. He says, do not be, uh, uh, in verse, uh, I forget which verse, it's 25, I believe. Uh, he says, uh, how long will you go limping between two different options? Because of the leadership, the king was worshiping 
Baal, and they were still, it was a God-fearing nation uh, from the origin. So they were going back and forth, like limping person. They, they were not confirmed. They were uh, confused of who to worship. He, they didn't know who the true God was. And he says, let's not go limping between these two options anymore. Let's settle it here. Let's see, let's see who the God is, the true God is. Whoever answers in fire, we will worship him. And all the prophets and all the of King Ahab and the prophets agreed. They thought this was well said. But we are worried for Elijah. Where did this boldness come from? You know, he must understand there are 840, 50 of them versus only him. Why would he make this such a bold challenge? What if things go wrong and doesn't work out the way he thought it would work? He could be endangering his own life. He's risking his own life uh, and betting uh, and putting this contest uh, to prove who is the true God. Well, so we know that uh, the Baal worshippers come together and uh, Elijah said, you go first. So from morning to noon, they, they uh, invoke uh, Baal's name, right? They probably sing all these songs and instrument music is playing while they're sacrificing to this God and asking this Baal God to reply, reply to us, O Baal. O Baal, come down to us. They're uh, frantically just uh, invoking this, this God and uh, they're waiting until fire is lit up in, on this altar, right? And so around noon, Elijah sees this and he's kind of tired. You know, you've been doing this all morning long. Maybe he's meditating. He's a god, right? Maybe he's meditating. Maybe he's traveling. Maybe he's asleep. You need to wake him up. And so this uh, stimulated the prophets of Baal. And what do they do? They do what is written in their rituals. And what their ritual says, in order to invoke their god, in order to, to uh, get a response from him, whenever there's a response, they would conf uh, afflict you know, wounds on their body. They would, uh, you know, cut themselves with spears and swords and, and blood. And when the God sees the blood, the violence, they would react somehow. So this is written in their law code. So they were hurting, harming, harming themselves. They were cutting themselves and bleeding and all this, this crazy, uh, you know, ritual was going on. But the Bible, again and again, it emphasizes and repeats this one thing. Verse 29, if you would look with me. This is what um, it says. And as midday passed, they travel, uh, rav raved on until the time of offering of uh, obligation, oblation, but there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Not only this single incident, but throughout the passage, this entire chapter, we find that there was no answer. It was quiet. Nobody paid attention. There was no reply from the other, other, other side. Um, and the Bible, the author is emphasizing that there is no response from this false God. And uh, there is a big problem for Elijah now as the day was waning because there was not much sunlight left. The bear worshiper had used up all the day, almost all the day, into the afternoon. And he only had a short window of time to ask his God, Yahweh God, to answer in fire. So again, he was on the defensive. He was just one man on the defensive, a short amount of time. But now it was Elijah's turn to ask God to answer. We can find that Elijah is quietly... Not like with a lot of noise and uh, all the frenzy, but quietly putting the stones back on the altar of God. You know, the reason that Elijah had called the worshippers of Baal to, be, to, to come together on this mountain of Carmel, there on the Mount Carmel, was, uh, it was a historical reason too. Because um, it was a historical site where God was worshipped in the old days. And when, as Elijah is seeing the old altar, he sees that it's all crumbled down. It's all broken down. And he's fixing it. You know, putting stone after stone. And he remembers the 12 stones that God commanded to put for Israel whenever they're worshiping God. The 12 stones represented the 12 tribes of Israel. As he was laying them on top of that, he was confirming in his heart, God, you've called us as your people, as your 12 tribes of Israel. And in his heart, he was praying to God this prayer. 
uh, we can, as we read this prayer of Elijah, we can see why Elijah had done all that he had done and what was going into in his heart. In verse 37, we can find that prayer of Elijah. If you would look with me, and it says, And at the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. He's invoking the name of his ancestors who originally set up this country, who blessed this beautiful people. Let it be known this day that you are God in Israel. He was not, you know, screaming out to the Lord. He wasn't, uh, you know, um, desperately seeking God's help. He was just saying, God, let them know that you are the true God. And he also says that, let them know that I am doing all this as your servant. We find out that this contest was set up not by Elijah, but God himself had told Elijah to do this. And he was simply obeying. And he says, oh God, reply, respond to me. He says it twice. And let them know that God, you are the God of Israel. Let them know that God, you are the God of second chances, that you, this is a time for them to repent and to, for them to know that you are the one true God. In Elijah, he was calm. He was sincere. But he gave this honest prayer to God. One thing you need to understand, remember, is that uh, before he said this prayer, he wanted to make sure that people understood that what's about to happen is not just natural phenomena. So when, they, when the, all the animal was set on the altar and the wood was there, he asked the people to pour water on the altar. Not just one bucket of water, but four buckets of water. Now, you have to understand, it was drought, so water was very precious, right? But Elijah thought this was definitely worth it. And he said, and when, and it was drenched in, in water, and people were thinking, what's going on? We've never seen anything like this in a sacrifice. He says, let's do it two more times, making it three times. Pour water upon water, and it was soaking and drenched, and, and they may actually uh, dug a trench so that water would not escape. And then after Elijah said this prayer, sure enough, God sent his fire and burnt everything on the altar. And the expression of the Bible is that this fire licked all the water off of the ground, making sure that this was not just natural happenstance, but it was an intervention of God. It was a divine appearance. And it was like difference between day and night. People knew who was the true God. Baal was the false God. And God responded to Elijah's prayer was the true God of, of their God, Israel's God. And they worshipped God. No more discussion. And they killed, slaughtered the false worshippers of Baal that day. So beautiful story, wonderful story, amazing story that you probably heard from your childhood if you went to Sunday school. Uh, but what does this mean for us? How does God answer us today? What significance does this ha story for have us today? Well, uh, I've written down two things in your bulletin. Um, and the first is that false gods require much sacrifice from us while giving us no response. God's uh, principle that he wants us to know this morning is that false gods, the idols, require much sacrifice from us, yet they cannot respond. They don't respond. You know, I don't think uh, in modern day America that any of you are having to keep idols in your home. You don't have idols, right? You don't have false gods like Baal. Baal used to look like a you know, bull horn and I mean a horned bull and you know they worship him and bow down and incense burns. You don't have that. Do you, have, you don't happen to have those things in your home, right? You can't buy them on Amazon.com, right? <laughs> well, unless, you know, maybe a Hindu person or other religion. We're not talking about idols when we talk about false gods. It's not just about the images, another, another religion that we're talking about this morning. There's a second meaning to what does it mean by a false god. And I read a theologian writing in his book this definition of a false god. Listen carefully. He says, whatever we try to derive, whatever we try to derive our core sense of meaning and worth is our god. Once again, whatever we try to derive, our core sense of meaning, our core sense of worth, is a false God. You know, our sense of worth, 
Our sense of being, identity comes from, it should come from God himself. We are the children of God. But if you're driving, uh, uh, deriving, if you get your identity, if you self, get your self-worth from some other thing than God, some other object, some other project, some other, some other career, that can be your false God. That can be your idol. Is there something that you put, you cherish so much in your life? It's usually those strengths in your life. Something that you always lift up as a trophy. Maybe it's a degree. Maybe it's a certain set skill in your life. Certain, maybe it's an experience, accomplishment in your life. And this is always something that gives you pride. It gives you self-confidence. It gives you self-worth. And secretly in your heart, you are worshiping it. When somebody recognizes that in you, you feel pride. You are, you are uh, you know, boldened. But if people don't recognize that thing that you cherish in your heart, somehow you, are, you feel dwindled and you feel worthless. Are there things like that in your life? For an athlete, uh, his or her health, her, her physical strength can be their false god. For a movie actor or actress, their face or their appearance, their, their glamorous bodies can be false gods. For those who are in research, maybe a, a essay paper, a research paper, a glorified paper can be their false god. Maybe for those who have a good degree or graduate from a prestigious school, that can be their god. Maybe their workplace, maybe their something accomplishment or a project that they've seen so much success can actually be a false god that they rely upon all the time. They remember it and cherish it and get their self-worth from it. I'm not saying all these things are bad in itself, right? We need these things. We need a degree. We need a job. We need you know, accomplishments in our lives. But if that becomes the fountain of your confidence, becomes the fountain of your identity and your self-worth, the Bible is calling it a false god. It is an idol that you're worshiping today. You see, you might think King Ahab's idol was, if you were to ask the Bible, the idol, idol was Baal, right? That's partially true. Yes, it was, it was uh, expressed in the form of this idol, Baal. But deep inside, the true idol, the true false god of Ahab was stability of his kingdom. We don't understand why, why Ahab chose uh, Baal against God in the first place. You know, Ahab was trying to stabilize his country, his nation, after he inherited it from his, his father, Omri. And uh, he was weak. So what does he do? He was trying to grasp other powers for help. And uh, where he reached was, he reached out to Phoenicia, or Sidonia, as the Bible says, in the northern uh, western coast of uh, Israel. This was a uh, seagoing country. It was a trading country with much wealth and a lot of exotic stuff from all over the world. Uh, Phoenicia is not on there, but you know, we should have seen this map way before. <laughs> anyway, the kingdom divided, and the green is the northern kingdom where Ahab was. Anyway, so in order to establish his, his reign, he does this uh, marriage. He gets into this marriage, contract marriage, with a princess of of Sidonia or Phoenicia. And her name was the famous uh, princess uh, Jezebel, right? And uh, her father was a Baal worshiper. In fact, if you read with me in 1 Kings chapter 16, 31, 33, I believe you probably have it, Faisal, on the screen for us. Um, I'll read it for us. This is what happened before in the earlier life of, of Ahab. It says, as, and as if it had been a light thing for him, this is uh, Ahab, to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, his ancestor, he, Ahab, took for his, for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians. Even this name, Ethbaal, has Baal in there. So this was a Baal, King Baal, actually, you know, worshiper of Baal, and went and served Baal and worshiped him. Ahab did. 32, he erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in his capital city, Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah. As 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 uh, Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Why would Ahab do such a foolish thing? 
It was for his stability. He wanted to gain the favor of this powerful nation to the north. He wanted to gain the wealth and the trading partnership with this country, all for the stability of this country. That was his true idol. It was not really Baal. If it was some other religion, he would have embraced that too. But he was worshiping Baal because he honored, he wanted to um, embrace his wife, Jezebel, who was a Baal worshiper. He wanted to embrace Phoenicia or Sidonia, which was a Baal worshiping country. And when God saw this, this uh, horrific uh, scene, he had to intervene and he had to tell, show all of Israel what the false God was, for what it, what it truly was, to reveal that this God cannot answer. That there is no life. There is no answer from this God. You know, uh, brothers and sisters, I believe idols have a very sneaky way of penetrating into our hearts. You know, uh, many years back, a couple of years back, I was praying, I was searching my heart. And there was a time when I had repent, repent. I had to repent before God because I realized there was an idol in my heart as well. And uh, the idol that I found in my heart was the idol of excellence in preaching. Um, that might sound kind of weird, right? <laughs> is preaching bad? Is an idol like Baal worshiping? Not like quite like, like, like that, but it was in the center of my heart. I was pursuing it more than what I was supposed to do. I realized that this was an idol in my heart because when I hear people talk good about my sermon, you know, pastor, this was a good sermon, whatever, I was blessed. I was a little bit you know, beefed up, encouraged. But when people gave no response, I felt diminished. I felt, you know, belittled. And as, as whatever people say, it, it uh, swayed my heart and, and it was waving like, it was a toss, being a taste, tossed in this way, that like a waves. I noticed that this is not from God. I am cherishing something in myself that uh, I should not cherish in the way I should. And I re recalled uh, as I came, before I came to the U.S. in Korea in the seminary, I had this ambition. I'm confessing here. I had the ambition, ambition, uh, ambition as I was studying seminary uh, studies that God, you know, I want to be like next Billy Graham. <laughs> you know, <laughs> preaching to thousands and thousands of people. That's, that was the time when Billy Graham was still alive. And I had this ambition. So I went I came to the States to study seminary, uh, further studies, and study preaching in particular. Listen to all the great preachers and analyze them and study them and imitate, try to imitate. And uh, at some point, I realized that this had become my idol. And so what, what was the mission given to me as a pastor? It was to be a messenger of the word. But uh, I was pursuing a different path. I was so uh, reacting to what people said about, uh, they, were, they said about my sermon. But after I had repented, um, I became so free. It didn't matter what people say or what they don't say because I knew that the worth, my value comes not from how eloquently I speak or how well I deliver and persuasive I am, but I am already accepted. I am already a messenger of God. Brothers and sisters, as we meditate upon this story, this well-known story, I want you to take your time sometime during the week, not just necessarily today, but sometime in your quiet time this week, and search in your heart. Ask God, Holy Spirit, to search in your heart for you. God, is there an idol in me? Again, it's something that you probably are very strong in, an area that you have pride in, that you trust in and rely upon. God, is there an area of my life, in my life, is there an idol there that I am trusting in more than you who gave everything to me? And we experienced it over and over again. As we trust our, our own idols, it just makes us more tired. It demands so much sacrifice from us without giving any answer, real like, solutions to life. How does God respond to us? He tells us first that idols do not respond and they just give us more fatigue and trouble. But how does God respond? God responds to us by revealing himself to us through his son. As we uh, f finish up this story, 
Of course, God is telling us that, again, once again, false gods cannot give us any response, and God is the true God. But I want us to go back to how that revelation came, that he is the true God, how the fire came. Imagine yourself, again, Elijah. You are the Elijah, putting, restoring that, that altar of the word of God, promise of God, of having you as his chosen people. And, and think of how Elijah was praying to God, sincerely, God, would you show up and prove to all that you are the real God? And, and God answered in prayer. How does God answer us as we go to him, as we rebuild our altars of word of God, as we rebuild our altar of prayer to God? In fact, God has already answered past the Old Testament into the New Testament. And we know God's answer was just like Elijah's, the answer that Elijah got. It was revealed to the entire, not only to Northern Kingdom, but to the entire world. And God, in the old days, sent a fire to set and know, let people know that this was his doing. In the latter days, in the last days, in fact, Hebrews tells us that he sent his son as the revelation as an answer to all our sin problems, all the struggles in our life. That is the answer that God has already given us. You see, the world, the false idols demand sacrifice, more sacrifice, more work, you know, more competitiveness, to, and, and it, does get, it, gives, it gives us nothing. But God sacrificed, God sacrificed his son to show himself to us and say, I have done it all. My son has paid the price. And now I am here. And he showed us this love on the cross of Jesus Christ. And how do we know that this son is actually son of God? Because God raised him up after the third day. And the, Christ, the cross and the resurrection is proof that God answered our most deep problem in our life, which is the sin problem. When we were yet sinners, God demonstrated his love by sending, sacrificing his, love, his son for us. And as a result, we have this confidence as we go to Father God. Romans 8, 15 to 16. Let's read these verses together, can we? It's right there on the screen, let's read. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adaptation as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears with witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Amen. As I, after I confess my sins of idolatry, idolizing my sermon, my work, my studies, I have so much freedom and now I go to the pulpit. I'm preaching this morning to you this morning. But I am free. I don't care what you say. I don't care how you respond. I am simply a messenger of him. And I'm already accepted. My self-worth, my value is from him. Not from interaction of society, what people re how people review and see me. And so I say with boldness, you know, although I'm this weak, you know, poor body and poor eloquence and all that, I am a messenger of God. So what do you say? You know, I'm a messenger of God. Who cares? And not just me. I, I pray and hope that you would have the same confession in your life. You can say in situations when society is reviewing you and evaluating, you can say, I am a daughter of God. I am a son of God. My worth does not come from my uh, accomplishments my production of whatever. It does not come from you. It does not come from the things of the I do not worship those false idols. They cannot respond. They do not give love. They do not give any life. But I belong to him because God has answered me already through Jesus Christ. And I, as I always remember, remind myself, as you, we all remind ourselves of the demonstration of God's love on the cross, his death and the resurrection, he answered, he already answered 2,000 years ago, but he answers us each morning. Why? Because Jesus, he is alive. He is with us. He speaks to us. He guides us. He is the good shepherd. And he's the true God that deserves our, you and I, our worship. Brothers and sisters, let's uh, use this week to rebuild 
the broken altar of the Word of God, the promise of God. Let's use this week as we go into the fall semester, fall season. Yes, use this week, use this week to, to amend the altar of our prayers to Him. And as we do these things, the Word and the, the, the prayer, and we're reminded of the work of Jesus Christ, the answer, not through fire, but the Son of God. And uh, we hear Him every day and know that we are following a true God who answers most powerfully each day. Let this uh, fellowship with God be in your life this week. Amen. Let's pray to our Lord. As we take a moment of uh, prayer time,